Hey, good morning. My name is Shad Wickstrom. I am one of the pastors here at Clearwater Church. I want to just take a minute. If you're a guest with us, on a, what I feel like is a really important morning for us at Clearwater Church and in our community. Um, I want to say hi to those watching online. There were a few that reached out and said they couldn't make it, but they'll be here with us online. We're glad that you're there. Uh, maybe you've been watching online for a while and you haven't come and, and uh, visit us in person. We would look forward to seeing you with us very soon uh, in person so we can meet you. Guys, we are continuing our series on uh, entitled Let's Get Coffee. And I love this because it really meets us right where we are. Uh, you've submitted questions, and let me tell you, you've given us some great homework for Randy and I to figure out how to answer some of these questions. And this may be one of the more important questions that we're going to take on, and that is mental health. That's what we're talking about today, which mental health is defined as a person's condition concerning their psychological and emotional well-being. So important for us to think about. We're going to spend two weeks on this, in fact, and today we're going to talk about what to do when I'm not okay. What do I do when I'm the one that feels like I'm breaking up and I don't know what to do and my mind doesn't seem right? We're going to focus on that this morning, and also uh, you're going to hear uh, some stories this morning from Ed and I in our own personal journey here in just a minute. Next week, I want to invite you to come back because we're going to have a panel discussion with some local mental health professionals who love Jesus and have been working with people in this area for quite some time. And we're going to hear their wisdom about what do we do when someone we care about or someone we love is not okay. So two very important weeks on uh, some important questions. And you guys, that was one of the number one things that you asked us about mental health uh, in the questions thus far. And if you haven't submitted a question, it's not too late. You can scan that QR code in the seat back in front of you. And if a question comes up today, just go ahead and submit it. We'll be taking these on for most of the summer. But let me just talk about why this is an important thing for us to consider. Why are we talking about mental health? First of all, this, is, this was said by the U.S. Surgeon General. The defining health crisis of this generation is mental health. Let that sink in for just a minute. One in five adults will experience mental illness in this next year. That in and of itself doesn't sound that big until you realize that 60 million Americans are going to face issues around this mental illness and mental health subject matter. Here's a very sobering statistic that you need to be aware of. In 2023, suicide rates were at an all-time high in the United States. Guys, we're talking about something very serious and very important. That's over 50,000 people this last year that gave up hope. When that hope is found in a place that we have discovered in Jesus, right? We have an answer for this generation that is struggling. And this is an important conversation that we're having. Another reason why we're talking about mental health today is not just because of the questions that were submitted. I think it's because in April, May, and June, those are considered peak times for suicides. This is an important thing, and my friends, the Bible and the Christian faith have a strong voice in this conversation. God made us and he intends for us to be whole and to experience healing and restoration in this life. Ed and I are going to share a little bit of our story. Ed, if you want to come up and I'll just share a little bit about why we decided to share some of our stories with you. First of all, the presented topic and question hit home for both of us. And we felt it was important for us to share a little bit of our story about how this mental health subject has hit, hit us personally. Secondly, and I really appreciate, Randy, that you, you lead us in this way. You are authentic and you share your story with us. And that is the reason why I'm willing to stand up here and share part of my story in this way. But as leaders and pastors, we want Clearwater to be a safe, listen carefully to this, we want Clearwater to be a safe place to share our stories. And it does start with us. So that's another reason why Ed and I are willing to share a little bit of our story this morning. And the truth is that all of us in this room are going to be touched by this issue in our lifetime, either in our own mental health journey or with someone that we know and love. 
We need to talk about this. And Jesus wants us to talk about it. And I consider it a privilege to take this on today. I'm going to start and I'll share a little bit of mine first. And it feels a little more natural to sit down, doesn't it? Is that, thank you for that, that idea. Um, so, um, I grew up in a, a pastor's family. Uh, I'm still getting to know most of you. Uh, Julie and I's journey here at Clearwater is still pretty brand new. Um, and so I haven't had a chance to share a whole lot of my story. So I'm, I'm excited to do that. I'm, I feel humbled and honored to do that this morning a little bit. But I grew up in a Christian home. Uh, my parents both love Jesus. And I've only known a Christian worldview uh, from birth. Um, I didn't always walk that way, though. Uh, along the way, I encountered some, some opportunities and, and uh, places where I made some choices that I look back and I, I regret. Uh, some of those things were things that happened to me that I didn't choose. Some of the things I chose to do. And so when I showed up in adulthood, even with a Christian worldview, I had some broken parts. And I still uh, pursued my call to be a pastor and carried some of that brokenness with me into, into ministry even. And uh, as I became uh, a father, I saw, I saw some of that brokenness start to come out and, and a struggle began to ensue in my inside life. And it was a struggle that followed with me until about 2016 or 2017. And I believe it was related in part to some of those things that I'd carried with me and hadn't really talked about. I was diagnosed uh, by uh, a friend, a counselor and mentor with depression and he recommended that I go and, and see a mental health professional and a, and a doctor and figure out if there was a way that I could get some help medically with that. So I was in ministry and still preaching every Sunday and trying to reach people with the gospel and hope and yet still struggling inside trying to find my own way. And I'm so thankful for a loving friend and mentor who said to me, Shad, you need to get some help because there's something beyond just the the mental and emotional and spiritual thing that you're going through. There is a physi physiological element to your journey. And I'm so thankful he said that because I went and I talked to my dad and I said, dad, I'm going through some weird stuff. I, I get up in the morning and I just feel like I can't even do the basic things. I'm struggling even to, to get ready for the day. And he said, you know what, son, I went through the same thing. And then I talked to my brothers, my two brothers, and they both said, hey, we're, we're kind of going through the same thing as well. And we finally started talking about it and recognizing that there is a genetic disposition to some of these things that we deal with. So I went and got help. And for about two years, I was on an antidepressant trying to figure out a journey and, and continue to heal spiritually, mentally, and emotionally. And what I learned about that is that our brains and our bodies uh, do have a reality that come into conflict with uh, those things like depression. And bipolar and other things that we've put terms on, but they're part of the reality of a broken world that God has given wisdom for us to seek help over. So having this conversation is in part letting you know that it's okay to say, you know what, I'm not doing okay. And if I can say it, you can say it as well and go and get that help. Through that two years, um, after I, I, I weaned off of the medication and learned to do more about my exercise and eating, and that certainly helped me a lot. But I know that, that God puts wisdom in doctors to help us through hard times. And it's okay to say, I need some help. And just want to encourage that in you today. And I want to invite Ed to share a little bit of his story now. Ed, take it away. Thank you. Test. Yeah, thank you. Um, I, I make sure that I guard... Um, myself and my family, um, especially being in leadership roles, it's really hard to know what to share or how much to share or yeah, all of that. And I, I, I make sure that I guard it as to why I've never shared this publicly um, in all the years. But in 2011, um, it all came to a head for me. Uh, I woke up one morning and I, and I just like, I couldn't do anything. I was just frozen. Walked to the bathroom. I didn't know what was, it was just overwhelming. This, this sense that I, I had kind of felt before in my past, but didn't really know um, what it was. But so much so that 
I went into my closet and I curled up in a ball and I just cried and I didn't know what. My wife came up and she's checking on me and I said, I can't even move from this place. Like, I don't, I don't know what's going on, but all I know is I want to die. I want to end my life. That's all I know. I just, I can't, I can't take it anymore. And so if you looked from the outside into our life, I'm in ministry, I have an amazing job, amazing home, beautiful kids that are all doing great. Um, but at the inside, there was something happening. And what it was, was years of trauma from my childhood that finally caught up to me. I was sexually abused for years, physically abused, verbally abused. And I thought I can just, since I'm saved now, that that stuff just goes away on its own. And so I don't have to deal with it anymore because I'm saved. And so why would it still come up? Like, why would I... Why would I still have to deal with this? And so I compartmentalized it and I put it back here. And I remember Blake Bush came to our house and my wife took me. They, uh, they put me in, into the, the UC Health behavioral unit. I stayed there a week. I got on medications. I came out and I was worse. Uh, and I went for three or four months doing every kind of psychiatric medication you can think of. Um, and finally, finally, I got some breakthrough through a, a, an amazing man, a counselor in Loveland. He's no longer a therapist anymore, but he was a, he's a Christian man who began to give me scripture and help me to understand like how God views where my heart is at and where my mind is at. I'd never researched that. I never looked into what God sees about it. But God says in Psalm 34, 18, that God is close to the brokenhearted and those who are crushed in their spirit. That's a promise. And there's so many promises that I could not see in the Bible. Like so many promises of God would be with me that I would never feel alone, that I could call upon him. Um, and that started my journey um, of my understanding this mental illness. And, and like you, I was genetically, from my family, um, found out that depression and, and bipolar and a bunch of different stuff from my grandfather uh, on down. And so I was diagnosed with bipolar bipolar one and depression. And that's what I have. And I take medication every day for it. And, and since then, it has not been an easy journey. My life has not been, I've had episodes, I've had, it's been years, but I've, I've come to a place where I've learned to more to rely on scripture, where it's so difficult to do that. Because when you get in that place, when you get in a place where there's no hope, where you just feel like there's nothing that you can do. There's no medication. There's no person. There's no therapist. There's nothing there. There's nothing there at all. When you get to that place, the, the scripture says, come to me, all you. Have the burden and I will give you rest. Another promise of God. And I begin to praise God. I begin to learn to worship him. I said one time up here that it's scientifically proven that you can't, you can't have anxiety and praise at the same time in your brain. Your brain can't do it both. It's either one or the other. And I've learned through time, and I'm not there yet. Trust me, I am not there yet. There's days that I just, I don't know how I'm going to get through it. But I want to thank you for letting me share this with you. Yeah. Because this is me being vulnerable, and I am not a person, I have a past that doesn't allow me to be vulnerable, because every time I was vulnerable, I got hurt. And so I want to thank you for letting me be vulnerable. I'm not... I'm 
I'm, I'm at a place now in my life where I have a support team. I have people around me. Um, and I think speaking like this yeah. is really, um, is really helpful. And I, I want it, I want it to reach one of you today because if there's one in five that says that they're dealing with mental illness, there's about 200 and some people in here. There's people here. You're dealing it. My, what I just shared, you feel it, you know it. Yeah. Um, and so thanks for letting me share this. Yeah. Thank you guys for letting us share our stories, both of us. Let's thank Ed too. Jesus. John 10, 10 says this, the thief's purpose is to steal, kill, and destroy. Jesus says, my purpose is to give them a rich and satisfying life. One of the ways that we move into that place of a rich and satisfying life is we're willing to be humble and vulnerable and real about our own stories. If you would, I want to just spend a few moments in the Bible together because the Bible does have something to say to this this morning. What do I do when I'm not okay? And for some of you, what we just shared with you maybe was what you needed this morning. And that's going to open up a whole new journey for you. For others, you need to be reminded of what the scriptures have to say about this issue and in the starting point. And so I want to get into a little bit of that this morning. What do we do when we're not okay? So the main idea of the message is this. Jesus is all about restoring life. So be willing to fight for your joy and for the joy of others around you. My friends, sometimes you don't have the strength to do it. And it is a battle to even say, I need help. I need something that I don't possess in and of myself. And I want to acknowledge that this morning. But if you would turn in your Bibles to Philippians chapter 4, I think there's some truth and some wisdom from Paul who had an affliction in his own life that God chose to never relieve him from. In fact, the Bible tells us God used that struggle to keep him humble because of the great things that God was entrusting to him. So, Sometimes God chooses not to heal us or to remove whatever infirmity that is, and there is a purpose behind it. But I want to read Philippians chapter 4, beginning in verse 4. It says this, Always be full of joy in the Lord. I say it again, rejoice. Let everyone see that you are considerate in all that you do. Remember, the Lord is coming soon. Don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank him for all that he has done. Then you will experience God's peace, which exceeds anything we can understand. His peace will guard your hearts and minds as you live in Christ Jesus. And now, dear brothers and sisters, one final thing. Fix your thoughts on what is pure and honorable and right or true and honorable and right and pure and lovely and admirable. Think about these things that are excellent and worthy of praise. Keep putting into practice all that you've learned and received from me. Everything you heard from me and see me doing, then the God of peace will be with you. Again, the main idea is this, Jesus is about restoring life. So be willing to fight for your joy and the joy of others around you. I want to pray just as we dig a little bit deeper into scripture. And I want to just ask you to bow your heads and close your eyes. And then I want you to pray right now. Ask God to speak to you. Would you just take a minute and you, where you're sitting right now or watching online, just say, God, would you speak to me? And now would you just pray for me right now as as I am asking God to speak through me to you. Would you pray for me for just a moment? God, I, I thank you that today you are here with us. We know that you are present with us. 
You're not bound by time or space or anything. You're with us. And you desire to speak something to each one of us today, whether it's for us or for someone we know and love. So God, I pray that our senses would be heightened. We would be aware of what you're saying to each one of us and that would settle deeply in our hearts today. We pray this in Jesus' name. Friends, health is a state of complete physical, mental, social, including spiritual well-being and not merely the absence of disease. And that is the life that God intends for you to experience, not perfectly on this side of eternity, but growing closer to that. Many mental illnesses can be prevented and the Bible gives us some profoundly helpful information that we can even start using today in our lives, in our lives. And as Randy did such a great job, we learned the past couple of weeks, the Bible is God's handbook and it reveals to us what we're to think about life, how we're to consider the things that are going on around us, how we're to consider the things that happen to us or the things that we've done. It gives us light and it illuminates a right understanding. And we live, this is the reality, you guys, we live in a culture that is so counter to that, right? Everything that comes from us via culture, is the worst news possible, right? If it bleeds, it leads. And that's constantly bombarding our minds and filling us with brokenness and thoughts that are negative. And none of us are immune to stress in that. All of us are afraid of something, and it might not reach the phobic level to where it's clinical, but we all have fears. And most often it exhibits itself in worry, which is also a form of fear. In our generation, this generation, all who are alive today on earth are characteristically defined in that world by anxiety. And we all know what it means to feel mentally, uh, emotionally, mentally, physically fatigued in this life, drained. And the Bible says this to us, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. What you think about, the battle begins in what goes on in your mind. And that's what we're going to talk about. That's the, the truth and the substance of what Paul reveals to us here. Jesus tells us in Matthew, do not be anxious for anything. How in the world do we do that in this broken, messed up world? Well, I would say to you, the starting point for us is a relationship with God through his son, Jesus Christ. That is a fundamental beginning. So you're not even going to be able to take your first step if you don't have Jesus as a part of your journey. That is your starting point. For those of us who have walked with Jesus and we find ourselves struggling with this, it's a reminder as to where we put our mind, where, what our thoughts are, where are we beginning the journey. And so that's what we're going to talk about. Here Paul gives us Christ-centered habits that lead to better mental health. So what we do when we're not okay. I'm going to move through this pretty quickly, so stay with me. I'll try to post the notes and the points so you can go back and, and soak them in. But you can also just read Philippians 4 and meditate on it this next couple of weeks. All right, so Paul says, number one in this passage, that we choose a habit of finding joy in the presence of God through all of life. That's his starting point. Now, if you love somebody, you know that it is a great joy to be with them, to be in their presence if you love them. In the Christian worldview, the Bible articulates that man's chief end is to reflect the image of God. We're made to, to show the world God, a part of God's character. We're made in his image, and we're also made to enjoy him for all of eternity, beginning right now. And when we honor God and we celebrate him and we worship him as we are doing this morning, joy begins to invade our space. And that's why when we sing, there's joy in the house of the Lord, that's what we mean, right? That's why we sing it out loud because we're experiencing that or we're moving toward that. Now, let me just remind you, in order to get to this place, you have to remember that it's not about you and it's not about me. When we come together, it's about him. When we have that mindset, we have a proper posture, and then joy begins to invade us as we praise God and as we gather with other people doing the same. Paul says it there in verse 4. He says it this way, Be full of joy in the Lord. I say it again, rejoice. That word joy there is literally, it means to be glad or be delighted, to to make a decision, to choose to be delighted in God. It is a choice that you make. It's not 
something that, that because Randy's a pastor, or I'm a pastor, or Ed is, or anybody else who's been following Jesus, just all of a sudden it happened to us. We make a decision to make the joy of the Lord a part of our journey. And you're not going to experience that if you don't take joy in his presence. Notice that word or the phrase there, it says, in the Lord. In other words, joy is cultivated in his presence when we're with him daily and gather with other people to worship and praise him. And it's cultivated in all of life's circumstances that way as we draw near to God and spend time in his presence. That's what Paul's talking about here. Psalm 16, David writes this, you make known to me the path of life. You will fill me with joy in your what? Presence. My friends, the absence of joy in your life is an indication that you are outside the presence of God in your life. Joy is an inside job and it's cultivated continually in the presence of God and when you're with his people. That's why we prioritize our gathering on Sundays. We do this come rain or shine. We do not fail to come together, even if COVID hits us again, right, or whatever. We will still meet and gather and worship Jesus inside, outside, or wherever. That was a silent moment. Do you agree with me on that? We will? Yes? Yeah, okay, I'm just checking. I'm just, I will be. It may be out on the lawn if that has to be the case, but I'm not going to stop gathering with God's people and in his presence, right? Nehemiah reminds the people as they came together after a broken time in captivity and they're rebuilding the wall and they begin to celebrate. He says, go and celebrate with a feast of rich foods and sweet drinks and share gifts of food with people who have nothing prepared. This is a sacred day before the Lord. He was rebuilding their community and the, the walls of protection. Do not be dejected and sad, he said, for the Lord, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. You find the joy of the Lord in his presence and with his people. Joy is a fruit of the Spirit in the Bible. It's a gift from God and it's in the evidence of the presence of God in our lives. And your time with God and with his people, his people are critical to your mental health. You need this. I need this. God knows it. And that's why he commanded it. Don't forsake coming together, not because he has some egotistical need for us to say something good about him. It's for us. It's the habit of worship. The second thing we see here in Paul's note and letter, he says, develop a habit of relying upon God's power every day through prayer. Prayer, my friends, is simply talking to God, saying things like, God, I need your help right now. In this moment, I need you. And if you're not a prayer, that's okay. You don't have to be. Because it's not about some sort of uh, an esoteric, uh, right-worded language. It's about what's going on in your life and in your reality, saying, God, I need you here. I need you right now. Or thank you, God, for what you've done. And that's all he is asking through that, that we simply express and enter that relationship through communication we call prayer. There's nothing God can't do when he's invited into the situation, but he's not going to force himself into your situation. He waits for you to invite him into it. Paul says there, don't worry about anything. In verse 6, the first part, instead pray about everything. That's how we access God's power. And if we do what God asks, we can count on his power to come through for us. There is a premise to his promises. And it doesn't take much just simply saying, God, I need your help. And he can't wait to come in. And reveal his presence to you. And that promise Paul talks about just a little bit later in verse 13. I can do everything through Christ who gives me strength. Notice again that phrase, that reminder, through Christ. The journey begins in a relationship with Jesus. And prayer is a part of that invitation. Admitting that you and I need help is the first step to all the good things God has planned for us. I've said this before, and I believe it to be true, that humility, that posture of humility is what invites God into our lives. And many of us are not experiencing it because we've, we've put up a wall. We've allowed pride to, to grow up inside of us, thinking that if we just try a little bit harder or we do a little bit more, 
that somehow things will change. And God says, no, it's the opposite of that. It's admitting that you don't have what it takes and that you need him. Psalm 29, 11 says, the Lord gives people, gives his people strength. The Lord blesses them with peace, peace. And so in other words, there's no situation, no circumstance that is ever beyond hope when Jesus is in the middle of it. If you want a journey towards mental health and, and be better, the habit of prayer is what is next for you. The third thing that Paul says there is embracing, a gratitude, uh, embracing gratitude for the good, the hard, and everything in between. My friends, God knows that we often forget what he's done in the past and in our lives. And he wants us to pray prayers that are filled with genuine praise and thanksgiving for what he's done. And as Ed said this morning, now modern science is catching up, right? They understand that in the brain, both anxiety and gratitude cannot exist simultaneously. Isn't that good to know that God always knew that? And he commanded that in our lives. Embracing gratitude. Paul says there in the second part of verse 6, thank God for all he has done. Just for a moment, imagine how God feels when we forget how his grace and his love and his mercy has moved in our lives. When we, we respond with indifference or forgetfulness or presumption, when we face difficult times, we can be blinded by our problems. They seem so huge. But if we take our eyes off the problem and we fix our eyes on God and what he has done, my friends, nothing is impossible. Nothing, no situation, no circumstance is impossible when you invite God into the middle of it and God wants to be there with you no matter what it is you're facing. Question comes up in this regard, what about the hard stuff? Because we're commanded to be thankful in all things for all that has happened. Well, God gives wisdom to us. We understand in James, brothers and sisters, when troubles of any kind any kind come your way, consider it an opportunity for what? Are you kidding me? What kind of weird thinking is that? Consider it a joy when my family member is struggling with mental health. What? Consider it a joy when I lose my job. Are you kidding me? No, we're not. Following Jesus is counterintuitive. And this is a big place for that. But here's why we consider it a great joy. Because you know that when your faith is tested, James 1, when your faith is tested, your endurance has a chance to grow. You're, so let it grow. And when your endurance is fully developed, you will be perfect and complete, needing nothing. God has you on a journey of becoming more whole. Part of that journey is the hard stuff. Number four here. Another habit, that was the habit of gratitude, the habit of worship, the habit of prayer, the habit of gratitude. These are all things that we can begin to move toward to be in better mental health. But the fourth thing we see here from Paul is this, we rest in the gift of God's peace. Would you do just for a moment, take a deep breath and let it out. Wasn't that good? You know what? I don't care what you're facing or what you're going through. You can rest right now in this moment. Just let God's peace wash over you. He's taken care of everything. He's got this. Sometimes we need to be reminded to rest in his peace. The dictionary word for rest is quiet, calmness, tranquility, peacefulness, serenity, stability. And it says, the Bible says, Jesus came to give peace to give us peace. Verse seven, as we worship, as we pray, as we embrace gratitude, this is what the promise is. You will experience God's peace, which exceeds anything you can understand. His peace will guard your hearts and minds as you live in Christ Jesus. And for Ed and I, in our stories, we would say, yes, that's what we've learned. We haven't walked it perfectly. There's brokenness along the way. But we have learned that as we rest in God's peace, he shows up and our minds are guarded. <clears throat> Paul's position here is good to remember uh, when he's writing this letter. Do you remember where he was when he wrote this letter? He was in prison. 
he was chained. He was chained to a guard or a couple guards writing this letter. Take joy, my friends, whenever there's trials. So he is literally practicing what he's preaching as he's writing this letter. I think that's beautiful. He's in prison because he's preaching the message of Jesus' life, death, and resurrection and how it brings salvation and true freedom and how ironic that he's chained and in prison. But he learned, he learned to rest in God's peace even in a devastating circumstance like that. Jesus promised there, I'm leaving with you with a gift, peace of mind and heart, and the peace I give is a gift The world cannot give, so don't be troubled or afraid. Do you want to know why anxiety and mental health is the leading concern for this generation? Because it's separated from the God who's made it. There is no peace without God in the middle of life because he's made you and he understands you and he knows your need. That's, that peace of God guards over two areas, worry, which is in the heart or wrong feeling, and the mind, which is wrong thinking. God moves in as we stay in his presence through worship, as we pray, as we embrace gratitude, as we rest in his peace. And lastly, as we choose, we make the choice and the decision to regularly think about God's plan. How hard is that with all that's going on in social media and and, and news and all those things that are happening in our world? It just happens and it shows up in our faces, doesn't it? It's there. It's present all the time. If we give life to it and that outweighs us thinking about God's plans and purpose, we begin to worry. We begin to be consumed. We forget that God is restoring Eden. God is restoring life and he's bringing truth to the world that one day every evil will be erased. Every tear will be wiped clean. We forget and we lose sight of that or we're disconnected from it. Think about this for a minute. Where does your mind wander when you have free time? When you're getting ready to to go to sleep at night, do you lay on your side kind of scrolling through the the stuff? I, I don't do that just so you know. I don't know what that looks like. I've never done that. Ever. I don't do that. <laughs> Thanks for calling me. Hold me accountable. I appreciate that. <laughs> Guys, we, we all find ourselves in moments of quietness, wandering. Sometimes our thoughts wander to our past, right? Something that was lost or stolen from us. And we let that rain and and all of a sudden we find ourselves depressed and sad, right? Something was lost or stolen. Over on the other side, we're thinking about an uncertain future and things that we can't control and manage. and, And we find ourselves all of a sudden filled with anxiety and worry. And neither of those places are where God wants us to live. He wants us to live in the present moment, right here, right now, resting in his peace. Verse 8 there, dear brothers, one final thing. Fix your thoughts on what is true and honorable and right and pure and lovely and admirable. Think about these things that are excellent and worthy of praise. A life that has a habit of worship, gathering with God's people regularly, talking to him daily, expressing gratitude for all that he's done and is doing resting in his peace and making the decision to think about what God is doing and what he's done and his plan for the world is a great first step when things aren't going well for you, when you don't feel okay. Beautiful verse that's often misquoted and taken out of context, but principally it has relevance here. For the nation of Israel, they were in a dark season and they needed to be reminded that God had something good planned. And he says this, and I believe principally it's for all of us to be reminded of today as we think about his plans. And he says this, I know the plans I have for you. They are plans for good and not for disaster to give you a future and a hope. The habit of right thinking These are the things that we can do immediately in our lives to stay on a positive track towards mental health. Now, I'm not going to say to you that's the answer for everyone this morning. 
but you might be in an okay place and you needed this reminder and you can jump on this journey right away, but you may be here this morning and, and you can't even begin to fathom putting that to work in your life. And I recognize that. I'm not putting a, a, a simple, quick fix on something that's very complex and very difficult. But you need to know this. Listen to this carefully. God is for you. Let me say that again. God is for you. One last time. God is for you. He is for you. Jesus is all about restoring life, so be willing to fight for your joy and the joy of others around you. Next week, we're going to talk about what to do when someone else is not okay in life, how you can be a part of that journey. But you can't help someone, right? What, when, you, when you're in an airplane and they, they tell you about uh, putting the oxygen mask on, right? Who do they tell you to put it on first, your child or yourself? yourself. You got to make sure you got the oxygen so you can actually help the other person. That's why we start to, to talk about what to do when, I, when I'm not okay and making sure our guard's up and we're ready to help others. So that's why we start with that today. But if you're in a place where you can't even begin to think about any of these things, I'm just going to ask you to do one thing today. This is your so what. This is your takeaway for those that you, I, you just couldn't, couldn't even get there. Tell someone you trust and ask them to pray for you. That's all I would ask you to do today. There's going to be some folks in the back near the sound booth today ready to pray for you. They are trustworthy people that love God and are happy and excited to welcome him into your journey. I just want to ask you to take a step of faith to fight for your joy today and go and ask them to pray for you. James 5.16 says this, confess your sins, confess your struggles to each other and pray for each other so you will be healed. The prayer of righteous person has great power and produces wonderful result, results. That's why I ask you to do that this morning because maybe you can't do it for yourself. Jesus says this in Matthew 11, your next steps this morning. Come to me, all who are weary and carry heavy burdens, like Ed, Ed quoted earlier, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Let me teach you because I'm humble and gentle at heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy to bear, and my burden I give you is light. Maybe you're carrying a burden that's just too heavy today. You're here by a divine appointment because God wanted you to hear this message or to receive that help. I don't think there are accidents. You're here today because he wants to begin healing and putting your life back together. Just want to encourage you to take that step. Maybe you've never given your life to Jesus. In Romans chapter 3, it says, we're made right with God by placing our faith in Jesus Christ. This is true for everyone who believes, no matter who we are. For everyone is sin. We all fall short of God's glorious standard. Yet God in his grace freely makes us right in his sight. He did this again through Christ Jesus when he freed us from the penalty for our sins. Would you pray with me as we ask God to continue to move in our hearts and our minds today? Guys, I know we've, we've gone a little bit over. We had a lot going on in the service today and we, we shared some stories, but don't let this moment pass you by to respond to what God's doing in you. If you've never given your life to Jesus, let me just offer you an opportunity to pray. The words that I'm sharing with you to pray are not a magical incantation. It's just me shepherding you, giving you an opportunity to respond to what God may be doing in your heart to trust Jesus for the first time. You can pray something like this. Dear God, thank you for making me and loving me Forgive me for ignoring you in my life and trying to do this in my own strength. I recognize that I need something more. I need you in my life. Thank you for sending Jesus to die for me, to take my sins away. I receive 
your salvation today. And I ask you to make my mind well. Father, I pray for those of us who are not doing okay. I pray, God, that you would stir in us in a way that healing would begin or even supernaturally move in right now. God, we know that you love to show your love to us. And sometimes that's through healing that we can't explain. And so I pray, God, in the name of Jesus, that today healing would happen. God, for those of us who have someone in our lives, I pray you would help us to, to be well, to put the oxygen mask on ourselves, to make sure that our mind is ready to walk with someone else. And we pray for those in our lives who are not doing well. God, we pray that you would give us the wisdom and insight to be those that walk with others, that share our stories, that find healing in moments like these. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.